Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today's journey, of course, because this is election season, we are going to visit with another candidate. And this one, well, okay. He's been a part of the legislature in Hawaii for a very long time. So most of you will know him. And that is Chris Lee, Representative Chris Lee. And now Chris has spent all those years as in the House. He is now going to run from the Senate for this strange configuration called District 25. So Chris, aloha. Aloha, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Now, Chris, is how long were you in the House, Chris? Since 2008, actually. So it's that was uh, President Obama's first election, election year. Oh, it's been a while. Yeah, <laughs> great. And so you were in the House that long. Uh, and now you're going to run for the Senate. So tell us about this Senate District 25, which is the craziest thing I've ever seen. But tell us about District 25. Yeah, it's not actually that much different than the House District. I mean, the, the area that I, I grew up in represented here in East Honolulu has always been um, Kailua, Waimanalo, um, and, and our, the playground that really I grew up in, going to Sandy's and, and um, hiking up in the hills up above Hawaii Kai has always been sort of the same. It's felt like the same community. But um, the Senate District um, includes not only Kailua and Waimanalo, but also Hawaii Kai proper. Um, Port Lock in those communities. And, and what's fascinating about it is even though it's a, a demographically and geographically very diverse set of communities, the I think the, the general issues that we've been working on collectively, um, protecting our uh, near shore uh, marine resources and protecting our, our lands from uh, overdevelopment and then ensuring that we have housing and all these things have been sort of the same throughout the communities though each community has approached it in a slightly different way. So it's been very exciting to um, step into this race because for the first time, not only will we be unofficially working these issues with our partner communities, but now we can do it officially. And with um, our current state Senator, Laura Thielen, stepping aside um, to, to go on to greener pastures, you know, it, it really opened up an opportunity that I've actually turned down before. You know, this has been an open Senate seat a few times um, over the last decade or so. And I was working on stuff in the house that I really wanted to accomplish and didn't want to walk away at that point. But um, here we are, you know, 2020, um, craziest year of all years. But having, I feel like, accomplished some of those big things that I really set out to do, this was the time it felt that it would be okay to step up and do something a little bit differently, working on these issues from a different perspective, helping out in the Senate. Well, what issues were they? What, which issues that you wanted to accomplish and you feel like you did what what were those you know when i when i first ran um it was really uh for a handful of things i mean on our side it was definitely environment and dealing with climate change the state at the time hadn't really done much and you know, on our side of the island we are um, going to be more affected than just about any other place we have beaches to lose we have um, homes to protect we have all these different things and um been really fortunate that over the last you know 12 years or so, I've been able to put into place our 100% uh, renewable energy law for the state, making Hawaii the first state to commit to that. Um, also carbon neutrality statewide, which is exciting because now it's going to capitalize on carbon credits and investment from outside the state to bring money right here to plant trees, to reduce our carbon emissions, to really catalyze jobs. And that's been something which has been um, really, really exciting. So having a lot of that stuff in place, um, there's been a few other big issues that we've started to work on. And, you know, this, this year, I think really illustrates one of the big ones, which is I wanted to do something to really fix um, Hawaii's just dismal record of uh, voter participation in our elections going back over the last couple of decades. And um, serving as judiciary chair, thanks to the support of my colleagues in the House, I've been able to help put forward, you know, our new law this year, which is voting by mail, um, which at least in the primary election a few months ago, has broken all state records going back to statehood. We've seen more people come out and vote and participate um, than ever before. And that's just so exciting because it means hopefully for this coming election in a couple of weeks, 
uh, for the general election, we're going to see that same kind of enthusiasm and get people engaged. And as we all know, once you start voting, you just don't stop. So this is really an opportunity to, for the first time, bring in a whole new generation of voters and get them involved. Well, now speaking of, since you're on the judiciary, or you were, Hawaii is one of the few states that uh, prisoners, people who have served their term, can vote. Do we have a way of reaching out? Has there been a way to reach out to them as they come out of, as they're released? In their release packet, is there a voter registration? Is there a letter that tells them that now you are free to do this? Do we reach out at all? Uh, I can't speak to the state side and how that process um, works. It, it's been somewhat um, separate, I think, coming out of transitioning out into you know some sort of um, path uh, to go back into the job market and, and reintegrate and all of that. And then elections have been treated separately. I know there are community groups that have been um, trying to help families who have been in you know rough spot and have family members, <clears throat> family members coming back into the fold that help them with these things. Um, so I think on a case by case basis, there has been uh, a few good examples of people reintegrating and um, finding jobs and, and being productive members of society and then participating, not just in voting, but there's actually a couple of really good examples of folks in the Waimanalo area who came out of um, uh, prison in the past, reintegrated, found jobs, had a family, not only started voting, but then created local nonprofits and organizations that have been providing resources to the community, helping other folks get engaged, helping our homeless situation, helping do all kinds of really neat stuff. So I think there is definitely an opportunity for folks, um, but we haven't systemically, I think, prescribed it in Hawaii. Well, the reason I say that is if you deny the person the right to vote, that's a lifetime sentence as opposed to just 10 years or four years or whatever to deny them that right. So my thought is that if in the discharge packet, there's a letter that says that you can now register to vote, it, I think it would give them a sense of be, really being back into the community. That's, that's all I'm saying. I, I don't know how you could make that happen, but since you were on the judiciary, um, I just thought about that. Yeah, I, well, there's gonna be a new judiciary chair next year, so we'll see. Uh... Uh, who that ends up being. And, you know, on the Senate side, um, hopefully I'll be playing a slightly different role, uh, but we'll be involved. So um, we can work with our colleagues uh, in the Senate Judiciary Committee to address these issues as well. Now, what would you like to do in the, on the Senate side? Do you have an idea what you would like? Well, I think, you know, there's a, there's a handful of issues. Like I said before, you know, I really felt like I had accomplished a handful of the bigger things that I really set out to in the house. But the thing that I think transcends any of those individual issues has been actually helping to get other people engaged. And that has been, I think, more of a, a win, a personal win for me than anything else. I've had friends, uh, one guy who had never voted, never really participated, um, who we were sitting on a couch one day just having drinks and he said, you know, what can I do? Um, to change some of these issues that I care about because he surfed a lot and saw pollution and all sorts of stuff going on in the water. And I said, well, you know, we can help. I'll help you write a bill and we can, we can address this. And it took two years, but two years later, here he is standing next to the governor. The governor signs a bill into law that prohibits the counties from just dumping sewage out into the ocean and sets a pathway to be able to manage that kind of situation island-wide and create a permanent infrastructure to better handle it so we don't have these kinds of um, pollution events. And this is a guy who not only um, helped write that and author it and bring community members together, but he got involved in um, getting the community organized around this effort. And he's one of a number of examples, I think, of folks that uh, I feel just really, really glad that I had an opportunity to at least open a door crack to. And these are the folks who are going to replace all of us, you know, who are going to be around oh, for a yeah. long time to come solving these problems. So um, I feel like coming out of the, the House, you know, that's, that's been the biggest win. So in the Senate, the question is not only how do we address these issues, but how do we really get people engaged beyond just voting? Because that is like the baseline minimum that we have an obligation to do as citizens in this country. But how do we get people involved in actually solving these issues in a concrete way, getting involved with organizations that are helping out, 
creating their own, um, really just getting people uh, to laser focus their attention onto some of these things that people constantly drive by and say, you know, I wish somebody would do something and then actually step up and do something about it. Well, now in East Honolulu, of course, is Hanama Bay. And we have seen Hanama Bay come back beautifully without the tourists. So, and I know that you have been, that's been one of your issues is Hanama Bay. So how do we look at that going forward? After seeing how beautiful it is without the tourists, how do we move forward? Yeah, it's, it's, um, I was actually out there a couple of weeks ago um, helping a few of the scientists catalog uh, different corals and their growth over time. And it is remarkable. If you were in the water in Hama Bay right now, uh, you would not recognize it because what it was, which I mean, pre-COVID, you know, is a tourist mecca um, covered with a slick of sunscreen on the surface of the water. It was just kind of gross. But now it's, it's, it feels like a regular beach. It feels pristine. And when we were in the water, there was a, a monk seal that had come up and was swimming alongside us doing its thing. There were turtles, there were fish, all of it was really coming back. And so the question is, how do you take this kind of um, regeneration and this sort of progress and ensure that we're not just going to go right back to where we were before and um, you know, fill the thing with people in an unsustainable way? And so you know, the city has been working on this already. We're working on the state side to do it as well to be able to capitalize on the, the demand to visit this place, this unique resource and um, create a revenue stream that can help uh, perpetuate its, its uh, rehabilitation over time. And so what that means is like in the large sense of trying to get wealthier, um, higher spending visitors to Hawaii and fewer of them, um, we wanna do the same thing for Hama Bay. If folks wanna go, they can pay a little bit more if they're tourists, still free for Kama'aina, um, but that money would go back into its restoration. And so we're working on that right now. We have plans, um, uh, with, working with a coral nursery, um, Friends of Hanama Bay and some of the other organizations that are doing work there to actually start not just better managing the place, but now replanting coral and actually regrowing Hanama Bay um, to what it would have naturally been, which many of us have never seen in our lifetimes. Well, now as a child, did you ever, we used to do storytelling at the top of Hanama Bay before it became a tourist mecca. Uh, did you ever go to the storytelling at Hanama Bay when I, you were I, a child? I, I, I recall going there, you know, in field trips and with uh, friends and family and, and that sort of thing. I don't remember um, the, the detail because I was just too young. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, growing up here, right, you, you go sort of because it's there, but it's not like one of the go-to beaches. Like, you're going to go to some other, like, Bellows or um, Makapu or, or one other beach uh, in the area before you go to Hanama Bay because it's just way less crowded and, and you see a lot of the same species actually mm -hmm. uh, a little bit offshore. But that's part of what we're trying to change too because you know the city and county has a contract with um, uh, Sea Grant uh, yeah. through UH and I'm actually on their advisory board. So we're gonna try and I think change the way that the narrative is set up right now from defining this place as a tourist attraction to defining it as a culturally significant and, and environmentally significant um, special place. And then with that mindset, um, educate tourists appropriately on what it means to go there and how to um, act respectfully and really help contribute to it rather than take. Now tell me about your district goes out into the ocean with all those Northern Hawaiian islands as a part of the city and county of Honolulu and, and the state. So tell us about those islands. Yeah, so um, the, the way the constitution is set up, all the um, sort of unattached islands outside of the main Hawaiian islands fall into the last Senate district and the last house district, which have been um, the district that I've currently represented as well as the one that I'm running for. And so that's the entire Northwestern Hawaiian Island chain from Hawaii all the way up to uh, Guam or up to Midway. And, you know, there's, there's not a lot of voters out there. <laughs> there are a few. Um, I've never actually been out to most of the islands. Um, it's just too remote and too difficult to get there. And I have had opportunities to, to go on like sort of scientific research missions, but the catch is like, there's one ship that goes out and it'll go out for a couple of weeks. So once you, once you commit, you're there. You're there. Um, yeah. So hopefully sometime soon I'll, I'll get to go, but What's significant about this is, you know, this is really like one of the 
the um, and Papahanaumokuakea, which is the monument, yes. actually um, helped run the uh, local campaign, organizing people to get involved to expand it. When um, Senator Schatz actually proposed an expansion a number of years ago, and we worked with the Obama administration, and we were successful. And uh, you know, we we stood there at UH. Um, the president flew in and signed the um, proclamation. Uh, expanding it and creating the world's largest uh, protected area on the planet. And this is, you know, thousands of miles across. And hopefully, um, in spite of COVID, in spite of climate change, in spite of all the things that we're worried about right now, I mean, this unique natural resource, which is pristine, um, remains that way. Uh, with the exception that uh, most of these places are just covered in plastic, which is a whole other yes, issue. Yes, of course, that's a uh, whole different in. Yeah, thing. so we're working on that separately, but, um, on a more global scale. It was somehow, and I don't don't know how, but most people have no idea that the city and county reaches that far. Is there a way that we uh, can become familiar with these islands? They're, you know, there must be something that we get to know our neighbors and get to know these islands. Uh, just like Nihihau seems like 2,000 miles away and we never get to go there. Is there some way we can find out about them, who are, where they are, who they are? Because it's all of the Northwestern islands. So- Yeah, I mean, um, you know, there, there, there are resources available um, for, the, for the textbook sort of look at these things, yeah. right? I mean, you can go to NOAA, you can go to the um, some of the other government agencies that do a lot of the uh, management work up there and they have a lot of good information um, and videos and all kinds of stuff. Bishop Museum has got, um, you know, locally here has got a lot of um, background on what's happening and what the, the cultural history is um, because, you know, these places have been explored before, um, although we're never sort of like permanent settlements. Um, but, but to actually go out there, and again, I haven't done this, but I'm told is, is really a life-changing event because you are perhaps on one of the rem most remote spots on the planet you can possibly be. There's no light pollution, there's no big city, there's, there's nothing around you but um, the Pacific Ocean and a small breeze that's, that's flowing over you and you look up and you can see all the stars completely unobstructed. And, and it's a unique experience that um, I hope people are able to one day sharing. But I think until we can better manage the resource and protect it, um, it, it will remain a little bit at a distance for most of us. Yeah. Well, it says all of the north northwestern islands. How many islands are there between here and uh, way um, or midway or? Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you the number. I mean, it's, uh, it's if you count like every little small tiny islet and everything else, it's probably hundreds. but. Um, but it, it is an, an archipelago that stretches, you know, it is, it is what Hawaii used to be. It, it, this is the yeah. old Hawaii that is eroded away. So it, it is part of our um, identity, I think, here in Hawaii, whether we recognize it or not. That's exciting that, um, that we have, or you have this opportunity and to care for these islands, that we, all of us, should be aware to care for these islands. Um, and not let it just go to rack and ruin or polluted or filled with plastic or whatever. But let's come back to Honolulu. Are there any special issues uh, that we have not talked about that you would like to see? Oh, in, absolutely. In coming up in the Senate. Well, tell us something special that you you want to do or I think the biggest thing um, is it, it sort of, it touches on sort of the, the unique moment we're in right now. I mean, for a long time, we've talked about being more sustainable and diversifying our economy and growing local food and all these different things that um, were sort of no-brainers before. And they're absolutely no-brainers now, um, seeing COVID sort of decimate our, our supply lines and everything else from time to time. I mean, I feel like this is the moment, these next couple of years, as we chart our way out of COVID and rebuild 
our economy in a way that is going to be different than before, whether we like it or not. But this is that moment to decide what that's going to be. And if we're going to do things truly differently and better prepare ourselves and become more resilient and build more of a circular economy that, that eliminates the, the billions of dollars that we're siphoning overseas to import food and fossil fuels and all these things we rely upon. I mean, that money can be given right back to our community, can create local jobs and local products here that replace all that. And I feel like now is the time to double down on all those commitments that we've made and that progress that we've charted, the stuff that I've helped work on already, getting us off of imported energy and fuel, helping to give grants to our local farms and clear up their ability to actually produce local food and then get it not just to the supermarket, but get it right to our tables to get it to our schools and our students, to do all these things that we for so long knew we had to do, but have not made enough progress on. Like this is that moment where we can change it all. We've never yes. had a better um, well, you're, incentive I, to do it. I'm agreeing with you because people, the tourists come from all over and they want Hawaii food. They don't want McDonald's and all of the other things. They want food that's indigenous to Hawaii, made, cooked, the kinds of things that you can only get in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And yet we don't, you don't do that for ourselves. We don't uh, support the farms that, that grow these special things. So I'm glad to hear you say that, that that's a focus because I think that's really the, where we need to be. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm excited about it. I mean, I really think we have opportunity that is right around the corner and so it's up to all of us and it's up to our community to get involved to make sure this happens because as much as um you know this should be the priority these things should be the priority there's going to be competing stuff that we just can't prepare for who knows what's coming next you know i mean who could have predicted 2020 so we'll need our community support to not only help us figure out what these solutions look like but to hold our feet to the fire as elected leaders and as um government in general to help compel that change well, uh, another thing is wellness tourism. That is with our climate and the beauty, it seems to me that we should have facilities where people can come to get well. Um, you know, for instance, if you have surgery at any hospital, it's $10,000 a day where if you had the surgery and you checked in at the Hilton, that's $500 a day. So uh, no, I don't, I'm not saying that you should do that. I'm just talking about the cost. So if we had facilities on all of the islands, especially some of those like Molokai that are not visited by a whole bunch of tourists, where people could come and, and do the wellness, just get well with the air, the, the ocean, uh, the things that that constitute wellness. Uh, I don't know, you know, people now go to Asia, to Thailand to do exactly that. So that's one of my, one of my biggies. Is yeah, wellness. I mean, there, there have been, um, I think certainly like placed in a cultural context, right? I mean, the way that, um, our indigenous community connects people with the land and, and does healing in a really unique way. I think is something that we can um, and, and really should make more of sort of a mainstream part of our, our modern Western medicine here. But I mean, just in general, being able to fix our system as it is, is gonna be a priority because um, I mean, COVID again is like a, a health pandemic emergency situation and even though we are by far and away one of the better states um, providing healthcare and insurance coverage for everybody, we still can do better. We still have portions of our population that don't have access. I think um, you know, our safety net itself is clearly outdated and, and watching this unemployment situation unfold this year and realizing that not only is the system inadequate to handle the kinds of support people truly need, but there's huge portions of people it just doesn't even cover in the first place all the folks who were registering for PUA um, for the pandemic unemployment insurance for individual sole proprietors and um, you know, Uber drivers and all these folks who work in a modern day gig economy, which just didn't exist you know, 20, 30 years ago, 
um, that is a huge gap in our safety net. And those people are hurting the most right now. And we're definitely not providing the resources to them that someone who's worked at a law firm for 40 years and got laid off is going to get. So we do have a lot of work to do. And it overlaps with healthcare and it overlaps with um, government assistance programs and, and everything else. And I'm really excited to see this opportunity, again, bring these things into focus. You know, I mean, COVID sucks, but the truth is there is a silver lining and it forces us as a society to rethink the way we do things and to change. Well, I'm a caregiver and I, one day I was fine and out in the world and then the next day I'm a caregiver and I'm learning uh, because nothing in my life prepared me for that. Uh, and there, I'm sure, I am sure with COVID, there are a lot of people like that, that all of a sudden, oh, now what do I do? So I'm sure that we need to look at, like you said, this whole system, the way we take care of each other, the whole medical system um, and what we do or don't do. But, and, and I think COVID has taught us all opened our eyes to a whole new world of how we care for each other. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see what happens because I feel like I'm not the only one talking about these kinds of things. There are definitely others. And as long as we can keep that momentum going over the next um, couple of years, I think we'll come out of this better than we went in over the long term. Oh, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we're, because we're all learning so much at right now as we move on with COVID. Listen, my dear, uh, tell us now, we only have a little bit of time left. Tell us exactly why we should vote for you. This is your time, so tell us. Um, well, you know, I think the bottom line is I'm from here. This has been home and everybody I think faces the same issues together. Um, I'm stepping up into uh, this role to run for the Senate because I feel like this is one opportunity to be able to change things. And I feel like in the House, I've definitely been able to help do that. And um, you know, I mean, we've not only got homeless people back into homes and changed our trajectory on climate change and protected people's civil rights and reduced costs for energy and daily living. I mean, all these things have been fantastic, but there's so much more to do. And I just feel like there's so much left undone um, so many projects that are sort of midway right now that uh, I'm committed to finishing them if people will give me the opportunity to help. And it's not something I do by myself by any means. We all play a role. And most of these things that we've accomplished have been together with community groups and with local neighbors and with the support of um, folks out in the district and around the islands and around the state. So um, I feel like this is that time for everybody to step up. This isn't just about who we're electing. It's about what we each are going to be doing to help support those people we elect and to help advance those issues and hold their feet to the fire to make sure that it gets done. And this is something that I feel like um, I've really come a long way on from naively thinking like, oh, we're going to change the world to actually know this is how we do it. And it's not just me. It's, and it's not overnight. It's incremental and it takes all of us. And so this is that next step that we have and the next opportunity into COVID, uh, I mean, coming out of COVID to really double down on these things and create that change. So I just ask for people's consideration. Um, I promise to keep doing what I'm doing um, and what our community needs to see. Wow. Well, you know, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And while I can't vote for you, but I do hope and trust that everybody in 25, tell us exactly where District 25 is. It's Kailua, it's Waimanalo, and it's Hawaii Kai. Okay. That's and so that. that's quite a stretch there. Anyway, and, and Hawaii Kai used to be part of Waimanalo anyway, but that's a different story. Now, thank you again. And I do hope and trust that this election will work out just fine for you. And we will have an event, a Zoom event, on the night of the election. So we will let you know, so you can join us. 
Sounds good. Again, good luck. And we'll see you next time.